Now we present to you the top 10 watches of Basel World 2020, should it have happened, and only including brands that would have presented at Basel in the last couple of years or so. So Nick, explain to me the format. It's a five on five, think of basketball. We're gonna take it in turns and see what we go through. I'm off. Number one, this watch right here. B camera, <laughs> this watch right here. The Longine Hydro Conquest Ceramic in Green. Now this watch has everything you'd expect from a higher price point watch at a very reasonable price of 2,175 Australian dollars. It has a ceramic bezel, it has 300 meters water resistance, it has a modified 2892 Eta movement, it has an integrated rubber strap. It really is a perfectly wearable, fantastic sports watch that I'm frankly wearing in non-sports scenarios as well. Yeah, good choice. For my first one, it's gonna be a watch that I spent a freezing couple of hours with in the Port Phillip Bay here in Melbourne. The Doxa Carbon uh, Sub 300 Aqualung. It's a very compelling watch for what you're getting for the money. It's a full carbon case and dial. Comes on an integrated rubber strap, very similar to that one over there, mm -hmm. uh, with a slightly different clasp. There's a titanium shell that protects the movement, which is also cost certified, unusual for Doxa. And it's just a, a fantastic watch. It's only about 87 grams, so a proper modern sports watch from a brand that has historically relied on uh, vintage reissues. I think it's a great step forward. And that's exactly the point with this Doxa, is that sometimes when you've had a lot of vintage reissues that are you know, hailed for their veracity to the original, you wonder where can this brand go? They're kind of boxed into a historical corner. Doxa have just smashed out of that with a very breakthrough colorway, like the yellow and the black. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's a very modern and cool. But it's still very Doxa because of the case shape, which is yeah. kind of consistent with the, uh, with the 60s and 70s. So, Cushion uh, baby. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool, I'm up again. What have you got? I'm gonna go a watch that excited me no end in January. It is the Hublot Integral, Big Bang Integral in King Gold. And I'm specifically choosing the King Gold because this, because of the nature of gold, it has a lot more sparkle and shine. So the chamfered edges and of, the, of each link have contrasting finishes. However, on the other versions, there was a lot less differentiation between the finishings. And also the weight of it is extremely luxe. You put this watch on, it's 42 mil, so for a Hublot it's not massive. And for a non-Hublot wearer until now, it's a lot less challenging because big watches aren't everyone's taste. And certainly for me, I don't like to get above 42 unless it's my big pilot. Um, but it's really a, a, a power watch that's expressed in a really tasteful way. And again, the design of this bracelet, Nick, these guys, four years on a bracelet. It's crazy how much development went into this, this one component that has, for me, kind of presented the best big bang I've ever seen. Fantastic. Yep. Alrighty, for my second choice, it's the Hamilton PSR. Um, it's just a really fun watch. It's a period of watchmaking that isn't really referenced that much anymore, uh, the kind of digital era or early digital era of 1970s. Uh, it's still got the kind of push button to show the time. I just really like it. Well, it's also, it's evoking, well, it's re-evoking a great movie. You know, Bond yep. seems to have been very much uh, ring-fenced by a couple of brands as being their boy, yep. but he he had quite a diverse range of watches. If you if you look at the full collection, That's this it. is one of them. Yeah, he uh, yeah he wasn't just restricted to uh, to mechanical watches. He was happy to to play in the the futuristic technology of the time. Um, and yet, Live and Let Die was a, a film made all the better for it. Yeah. It's a couple of years before I was born, which you know, increasingly I, I can't say that very often these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ripper, and again, it's a. When, when we saw Better Call Saul wearing a similar watch, it just has massive Colson. mood. It's a yep. really big mood. I, yep. I'm into it. Yep. What have you got next, Andrew? I am moving to, I think there's only one other time in Time and Tide's six year history that I have chosen a women's watch in my top 10. Not because I don't like women's watches, just because they don't really speak to me in the same way as a watch designed for my gender. Understandable. The Midnight Defy. I'm just gonna keep talking about it because I think that this watch is so clever and so simple. Like it's, there's, there's, the best poetry is for me, it's not elaborate with 
endless heroic couplets. It's something that can be very, very simply said. And this is a watch that reflects the night sky, the graduation of the night sky from light to dark in, uh, in that vertical graduation in the same way that the James Cameron Deep Sea Sea Dweller did. Uh, but it has a spray of, of, of stars yep. in the upper realm. And across a, a few different colorways, we get a sense of different skies. There's a, a nice sort of pitch blue midnight sky. There's a gray early dawn or, or dusk with a pink musky tint. Yep. It's just beautiful. And I, fe I just felt myself really moved by the, the simple creativity of that collection. And like I've said many times, I think that this has um, massive potential to migrate into a man's watch, which hasn't has happened many times in watchmaking, watches being designed for women that end up with men. I yeah. want it to happen. I've said that lots of times. Yeah, I hope it does. Yeah. Next up for me, I have got a uh, brand that's very close to my heart, Grand Seiko. This is the 60th anniversary since the first Grand Seikos were made. And these are recreations of those watches. So there's three different variations of them. One with a blue dial, I think that's in titanium. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a yellow gold one with a sort of eggshell dial and also- Let's call it champagne. Champagne, yeah. champagne dial, kind of tinge to it. And then there's also a platinum one with a, with a whiter dial. I've got to say the yellow gold for me, there's just something very classy about it. It's mm. clean, it's simple, there's no fuss, but it's just really, really beautifully put together. It is, and, and Grand Seiko's 60th anniversary models are exemplifying the fact that simplicity never goes out of style. Number four from me is one that instantaneous, knew it was in my top 10 for the year, and it was January. Again, it was one of those bold comments, but the Octo Finissimo Satinato in steel with a black dial, Look, it could easily be the blue dial, which yep. has since been released, but I haven't seen it. So I can't I can't include it if I haven't seen it. The black one alone was was enough though. The Satinato refers to the different finishings that are applied to all these. To me, it feels like thousands of facets on this watch. Yeah. It's an angular watch. It's angular, it's it, there's there's an edge to every edge, there's an edge to that edge. It, and then as you apply different finishings to all of these, it really, it lifts what a masterpiece the Finissimo is straight off that, that object. And you just think, wow, this is a lot of work. And one small detail, when you look at this Finissimo Satinato, the bezel is a different finishing to the, um, the shape that it's within. And yet it's only a millimeter or two above that shape. And you think, okay, well, that's because they've applied this bezel it's, it's extra to the case. It's not, it's all the same piece of metal. It just takes these unbelievable craftsmen and you know, it takes unbelievable engineering to be able to bring different lusters to all of these levels of the watch. So look, for that reason and the fact that it feels bloody nice, it's a little bit heavier than the titanium. Like if you had an issue with a watch that was super light, um, it's there and it's now 100 meters water resistant. So, where maybe the titanium was a bit of a showpiece that you'd you know, put on the bedside table when you went for a swim, you can definitely jump in now with the, uh, the Satinato and steel. I love it. It's a, it's a serious sports watch. Um, they've been playing around the edges for a little while and they've, they've, they've taken the plunge. It's well, very, very good. They have and they, look, they've been able to do sports watches, but, but none that have, none in a particular style that is unique to the house. Yep. And yet the Finissimo instantly, as soon as it was released was, okay, well, I guess that's Bulgari's expression of masculinity and an expression of modern watchmaking. Now it's an expression of those things that is very viable to, to not leave the wrist ever. Like this is a watch you can wear everywhere. I really feel like I talk a lot about it. <laughs> it's awesome. That, that and the Midnight of Fire. Next up for me, we've got the Casio NASA Limited Edition. Again, another little fun one. You've got some quirky retro watches in there. I just like them. Yeah, I'm it's, down with that. It's it's just a little bit different. It feels like you want fun in your life. Yeah, I, I don't think watchmaking always has to be taken too seriously. Clearly not. Um, I think that there's, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity for people to really enjoy the hobby at any price point. And I think this Casio NASA is a fantastic example of it. It's not very expensive, only a few hundred Australian dollars. It has the uh, iconic uh, NASA worm logo, um, no other real branding to it. It's otherwise a fairly pristine white. And I just think it's, yeah, not something we've really seen from G-Shop before. And the best thing about this watch is yes. the way that you can 
Press the button, illuminate the dial, and you get a sort of superimposed image of the moon, which is quite cool. Nice touch, nice touch. <laughs> Lastly for me, it's pretty serious actually, and it's pretty new. I've been crushing on the Glacier Originals 60 series Glacier, Glacial Blue? Glacier, Glacier Blue? Blue, yep. One of those two, since I saw the artist impressions and since I saw the renders. But then when I saw it photographed, my infatuation went to another level. And I've since discovered only today, in the notes that was kindly provided by Nicholas Kenyon, thank you Nick, the artistry in this dial. Because it is two intersecting fine arts. We have degradé finishing and we have sunray finishing occurring on the same dial. And it is magnificent. So the glacial blue is again this very washed out pale blue yep. um, with that that is degradé, meaning that it, it intensifies towards the outer. I think in this one, it's darker and then gets brighter yes, as you go. Yes, exactly. In. Um, so it is very much like the Iris of an eye. I can't get enough of this watch. I'm going to go the time only model. Yeah. Um, because the chronograph, I just don't think you really need anything to. to, to to make it more complicated. Doesn't need anything else. Yeah. Um, I absolutely adore it, and I think that um, it is a, a new expression of what has been a very successful little twist for Glass Shoot Original, which yeah. was the 60s series. First in those really vibrant, lurid orange and green, and now we have this very pale. Pale. Oh, it's just, it's like looking, it's quite freaky, you know, in a good mm. way. It's like looking into an eye. It, um, yeah, it's not often when you look at watches as much as we do that you see something totally new. It makes um, you kind of like, you know, stumbling over my words back there. That wasn't me being unprofessional. That was me being, <laughs> I, I'm still Deeply struggling. I'm, I'm struggling to <laughs> describe the, uh, the artistry at work here because this is, and again, a couple of other details. It has a, um, box sapphire crystal on the dial side. It has a box sapphire crystal on the case yep. back side. So you can see the movement uh, through the case back as well. Nick, what a game of basketball. <clears throat> Lucky last for me. Yep, oh, okay. Nick, <laughs> <laughs> you can take the final line on us. What do you got? Uh, <laughs> another fun one? Uh, it is another pretty fun one, I think. It's the SBB 149 from Seiko. That's not fun, that's just great. They've been doing a really good job recently. Um, it's 55th anniversary of their first ever dive watch, of which this is an expression. They have released a couple of watches with similar sorts of case styles this year, but I think the 149 specifically in terms of the dial color um, is most consistent with the original. It's a great size, 40 and a half millimeters. I think 13.2 maybe thick. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. And it's usually a when someone says, oh, I've got a limited edition of 5,000 watches, we'd snigger a little bit. We're not really sniggering because this is almost certainly going to sell out. I mean, the the feedback, the traffic, the, the riot that yeah. we've experienced when we released first the pictures and then the video, it's crazy. There's something yep. about this watch. You've yep. gone for an absolute crowd pleaser to finish, so that's fine. You know, you take the take the obvious, most popular one. That's cool. You have that. It, it's a great price as well. It's only nineteen ninety five Australian dollars. Yep. Um, I think at that price point, five and a half thousand of them shouldn't be too hard to sell. Yeah. So there you have it. There's ten watches that we've loved from a Basel world that never happened. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please let us know what you thought in the comments. And you know, if you would like to watch the longer version of Basel World 2020, pretend fake edition, um, just keep watching because it's in the end screen. Thanks very much.